Good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth installment of the LAS Dean's Distinguished Lecture. I am so glad that so many of you have come out despite our less than lovely weather outside. When I saw it was raining, I thought, oh gosh, we are not gonna have a good in-person turnout, but I am so pleased that we are the type of people that the intellect allows us to come out and brave the elements so that we can engage in lovely conversation. So uh, with that said, I am Venetria Patton, Harry E. Preble Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and a professor of English and African American Studies. I am thrilled that you could join us here in person and online for today's talk. I'd like to now invite G.U. Kim, one of our LAS leaders, to the podium to read our land acknowledgement statement. We'd like to begin today by recognizing and acknowledging that we're on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Weya, Miami, Maskutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. And these lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois has a particular responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as the stories, histories of this possession that have allowed for the growth of this institution for the past 150 years. We are also obligated to reflect on and actively address these histories and the role that this university has played in shaping them. This acknowledgement is critical as we move forward as a community. Thank you. Thank you, GU. The LAS Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series launched during the 2019-20 academic year with the goal of ensuring that our LAS community and the broader university community have the opportunity to learn from some of our most distinguished LAS faculty members. These lectures are a wonderful opportunity to move beyond our comfort zones and to learn about a topic that isn't necessarily our areas of study or expertise. Along the same lines, through this lecture series, we hope to bring together people from across our community so that we may learn from and appreciate each other and the many different perspectives and insights we share. After the talk, I encourage you to ask questions and to stay for the reception to continue the discussion. My hope is that you'll leave here today enlightened and better connected to our wonderful community. The College of LAS is home to an amazing array of scholars who do groundbreaking research in the mathematical life and physical sciences, create important understanding of people, cultures, languages, and literature through the humanities, and further our knowledge of humans and human behavior across the social and behavioral social sciences. Within the College of LAS, we have more than 600 faculty members, many of whom are leaders in their fields. These distinguished individuals travel the world to research, collaborate, and share their expertise. Today, I am pleased to present you with an opportunity to hear from one of these distinguished faculty members. We are so fortunate to have Professor Lisa Lucero as our speaker today. Professor Lucero is a member of our Department of Anthropology and an affiliate of the Program of Medieval Studies. She earned her bachelor's in anthropology from Colorado State University and both her master's and PhD in archeology span from the University of California, Los Angeles. 
Professor Lucera served as a Chancellor's Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, before becoming an Assistant Professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at New Mexico State University. She came to the U of I as an Associate Professor in 2007 and was promoted to full professor in 2011. Professor Lucera is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She is past president of the American Anthropological Association Archaeology Division. Her students regularly rank her among our most excellent teachers. Professor Lucero has been conducting archaeology in Belize for over 30 years and has authored seven books, an array of articles and book chapters. Her interests focus on ritual and power, water management, the impact of climate change on society, sustainability in tropical regions, and the ancestral Maya. She uses her insights from traditional Maya culture to promote tropical sustainability and to address global climate change. I am so grateful that she accepted my invitation to present her work today. Lisa, please come to the podium. Thank you for that, Dean Patton. And I'm so honored to be here and so honored to be invited to be a distinguished lecturer here. Um, and also, I want to thank the living and ancestral Maya. Um, I would not be here if it were not for them teaching me the lessons I hope to share with you and others throughout this um, lecture today. So I will talk about the classic Maya kings, reservoirs, and climate change, um, their inclusive worldview, and how this results in a collaboration with the non-human world, exemplified at Car Blanca in Belize, and then I end with insights and current applications. Now, the Maya area, and I'm going to get the cursor here. OK, maybe not. Um, anyway, I work in um, part of Central America. And you can see this little map here, the northern and the southern. I focus in the southern Maya lowlands, which includes um, Belize and the northern uh, part of Guatemala and parts of Western Honduras and southeastern Mexico. It's different from the northern lowlands. Now, the interesting thing about this tropical area, which is it's, it is a tropical area, semi-tropical area, is that ironically surface water is relatively limited because of the porous limestone um, bedrock. So there's a lot of rainfall, but much, much of it seeps through. So there's not as many lakes and rivers as you would think, especially in the interior southern lowlands and, and where the water table is really deep. There are bajos or seasonal wetlands, but they're seasonal during the rainy season. And this becomes an issue during the dry season. Now, there were hundreds of cities and hundreds of kings. There wasn't one overarching king like you find elsewhere. But the political powerhouses like Tikal and Naranjo in Guatemala, Calakmul in Mexico, and Caracol in Belize, none of these are located near lakes or rivers. And I'll explain what this means. Now, this was a hierarchical society with a king on top and nobil um, nobility and aristocrats and artisans. And at the bottom were the 99 percenters. You know, they're the people who built everything, who provided the services, goods, and tribute and labor. Um, and they're a rainfall dependent society. They didn't have beasts of burden. There's no wheeled carts. There are no um, metals in geo geo geologically in this area. And there aren't really extensive irrigation systems because most rivers that do exist are entrenched, like in gullies or river, steep river valleys. And they focus on labor-intensive projects versus technology-based projects. And all this will become significant at the end. And I'm going to focus on the late classic period between 600 and 800. This is the height of political power, the height of political density, the height of um, of land use and everything in the semi-tropical area. And the key thing in this area is water. Um, there's seasonality. You have issues of a seven-month rainy season and a five-month dry season. Sometimes you have too much water. Sometimes there's not enough. 
Um, and during the five month dry season, it becomes a green desert. If you're in the desert, I mean, if you're in this green desert and you're surrounded by all this beautiful jungle vegetation, but if you do not know where to find water, you can die of dehydration. So water is critical. Water is life. Water is everything. Then you have your tropical storms. Then you have your annual hurricane season. So there's, again, this, this pulsating system of too much, not enough, too much, not enough. And also, like many other areas of the tropics, it's, you have this high biodiversity, but it's dispersed. And this map is of the soil types relating to hand cultivation. Um, so class one are alluvium, which is rare because most um, uh, rivers are entrenched, but this area has a broad alluvium, so you have um, this high settlement density. But the class two soils, you can see here, um, they are dispersed. And these are some of the best soils in the tropical world. They're great for hand cultivation. You can plant two, um, two crops a year in some cases. Very rich, but they're, they're very dispersed. And all of these things will make sense. Now, the majority of Maya, the 99 percenters, lived traditionally, traditional Maya still today live in thatch huts, which are great for the tropical environment because they're cool and dark. This is something you need where um, when we work, sometimes it's, it's with humidity and temperature, it's 120 degrees, all right? Now, this is what the houses look like today, and the lower left-hand corners are what the houses look like when we excavate them in the sense, of course, all of the organic matter has decomposed in the humid tropics, but we're left with the foundation stones, and um, the Bs stand for burials, because the Maya would bury many of family members in the floors of their houses or tombs, depending on their, their status in society. And archaeologists estimate that about 10% of Maya are buried in the floors of their houses and tombs and palaces and the like. The question is, what happened to those 90%? Again, I'll come to that to the end. Now, the late classic settlement, which has been revealed even further thanks to LIDAR, which has exposed all of this dispersed settlement surrounding these cities that consist of temples and plazas and the like. But there, it's a centrifugal system because during the rainy season, that's the agricultural intensive period. And because of those dispersed fertile soils, you have dispersed farmers, you have dispersed subjects. They're growing maize, beans, squash, manioc, cacao, tomatoes, tobacco, pineapple, avocados, and a plethora of other kinds of multi-crops, different kinds of plants. I think it's 4th of July. Um, and the rural farmers, though, provided tribute to urban royals, labor, services, goods. Why? Because of the reservoirs in these centers, which also happened to be located next to temples and um, palaces and the like. They're literally next door to monumental architecture. They're literally next door to this royal architecture. So you have reservoirs and markets and public ceremonies and pomp and circumstance, ball games, et cetera. And I argue there was some degree of seasonal power to go along with a pulsating tropical system. Um, now, the reservoirs is something I want to focus on because it's relevant for understanding political power, but also understanding relevant aspects for today. Now, these are still water systems beginning about 400 BCE with um, gravity-fed depression filling reservoirs. And later, they became more sophisticated, more engineered, more labor-intensive. Um, and they were basically these elevated stream damming reservoirs, elevated reservoirs, basically. Um, and they had all of these things, this whole water system, you know, sealants, sluices, dams, berms, spillways, channels, et cetera. Very complicated system that revolts, resulted in a city whose whole urban layout grew up, evolved, developed around these water systems. And so you have these causeways, these processional causeways, Sock Bay, that are also act as dams. Okay, so you have these multifunctional, multi-use kind of features in the urban settings. And then the downslope um, margin, uh, margin reservoirs and aguadas or natural sinkholes, um, think gray water, can be used for orchards, gardens, urban fields, fish ponds, construction projects to attract game and waterfowl. And so the whole urban layout is a water system, and this is, is very critical. Now the issue is, remember I said still water. That's the same thing as saying standing water. OK? 
okay? So the main problem would have been water quality, which is a problem today. The major issue we hear about after a storm, after a flood, the water quality, the spread of cholera, the spread of other waterborne diseases. So think about the Maya, annual dry season, five months, three months of which it does not rain a drop. No rain, high temperatures and high humidity, and you need a lot of drinking water to survive. So standing water, as we all know, has a potential to become stagnant which is prime breeding grounds for pests like mosquitoes, um, waterborne diseases, the buildup of nitrogen and phosphorus and other organic chemicals kind of thing, which promotes algal growth and all this kind of thing. You know, you've all seen standing water. You've all seen dirty standing water. Are you gonna drink it? No. So my question is, how did the Maya maintain water quality given that reservoirs and kingship, hmm, lasted for about a thousand years? Well, I argue and, um, that they applied their traditional ecological knowledge after having lived there for thousands and thousands of years and mimicked wetland biospheres to create self-cleaning reservoirs, which civil engineers today called constructed wetlands. And it, it, this includes um, different kinds of aquatic plants, macrophytic, which live in or near water, and hydrophytic, which live in the water um, and grow and other organisms, bacteria, fish, the certain mix of certain kinds of things work together to keep water clean, naturally, no chemicals, all right? For example, biofilms created from decomposing plants absorb nitrogen. Aquatic plants, all plants absorb nitrogen and phosphorus, etc. okay? Now, and they also, they also support diverse biota. You have edible and medicinal plants. Um, reeds, bamboo, fish, all kinds of fish, eels, turtles, crabs, shrimp, mollusks, snails. It's like an aquatic refrigerator. And you've got bottom debris that has to be cleaned out. Fish feces, per, you know, great for fertilizer. Also, the Maya would have had to harvest and replenish the aquatic plants, saturated with nitrogen and phosphorus, which, which would also make great fertilizer for the urban fields and gardens. Okay. Now, Oftentimes, even today, on reservoirs that still hold water, that haven't been maintained for over a thousand years, still have, some of them anyway, have water lilies, particularly Nymphaea ampla. However, and many people have assumed that they were part of the cleansing process because all aquatic plants absorb nitrogen and phosphorus and other kinds of things. However, while Nymphaea ampla, while water lilies do indeed absorb nitrogen and all this stuff. They're actually very sensitive water plants. They can't be in water with too much calcium, too much algae. Can't to be too much movement. They're very, very sensitive. But when they're there, the water is clean. It's drinkable. Okay? So when water lilies are present, that means the water is drinkable. Okay? Now, water lilies proliferate in the iconography, particularly associated with Maya kingship. So kings not only are associated with providing water, but clean water. And that's something, again, we deal with today. I mean, you can have tons of water, but if it isn't clean, it's moot, yeah? So kings are water managers. They perform the vital rain and water ceremonies. They organize the maintenance of their reservoirs. It's the foundation of their power. It's the foundation of their power and basically the major foundation of their power. And what do financial advisors tell us? Diversify your portfolio. They did not. But still, the system lasted for a thousand years. So, so what's gonna interfere with this? Because by 900 CE, hundreds of these centers in the southern Maya lowlands, there was an urban diaspora. Maya left. They left their cities, they left their kings. They made a decision to save their families. They left. There was no massive violence. There was no massive war. It was just, bye. Now, there's increasing evidence to show that there were several prolonged droughts. I mean, one drought, two droughts, you know, you have some backup. But in the humid tropics, unlike in the temperate or arid areas, it's very hard to store grains, the humidity. You know, they stored water. So um, 
evidence like from stalagmites and other speleothems from caves, and like they're like tree rings. They do oxygen isotope analysis. And this one shows that between 800 and 935 CE, there were eight, three to 18 year long droughts. And it's rainfall dependent. So there's no irrigation system. So you're completely relying on chalk, the rain god. Okay. And for some reason, he, she were upset because there's different aspects of these gods. It's not simple to say. Okay, so terminal classic drought set in motions events because everything is complex and multidimensional. It exacerbated any existing problems because each of these hundreds of centers had their own histories. People left cities and kings by 900 CE. Um, they, Maya families and farmers immigrated out of the interior to coastal areas and near surface water, you know, the lakes and rivers, and it became more maritime focused. Kings disappeared forever in the Southern Maya lowlands. Northern lowlands is another story. Um, but the issue is that they are path dependent. Does that term sound familiar? Fossil fuels, path dependency, relying on um, one thing. Now, families persevered and they still do. There's over seven, 7 million Maya living today in Central America and throughout um, the globe. Um, and it speaks to their sustainable way of life because for 4,000 years they've been farming. 4,000 years of farming without massive deforestation without causing the extinction of any plants or animals. Okay. So how? How did they do this? Um, I argue, and um, convincingly as well, that it was due to their inclusive worldview that guided their daily existence and engagement with the non-human world. In other words, they collaborated with non-humans. So the Maya inclusive worldview situates objects, humans, animals, land, water, everything on the same plane. Not that everything's equal, no, but everything's on the same plane and every entity has a role to play in maintaining themselves and the world itself. So the Maya were one with world rather than nature, i.e. it was non-anthropocentric. So everything is animated, everything is animated, everything has a soul, and it, the, the significant is souls interacting with other, and this comes from ethnography, ethnohistory, inscriptions, um, stories, poems, and the archaeological record. And so everything is connected, it's, it's more of a merged existence, and our, our, our Cartesian dualistic, you know, English terminal, uh, language really can't convey a lot of their ideas. Um, but this quote here from, um, uh, uh, this, um, a book by uh, Mayan women, several poems and the like, all mountains are dressed as father mothers. You know, because they're just, we don't have the terminology that reflects this merged existence, okay? And it's also, instead of a linear, you know, past, present, future, they think in a more circular, and a lot of people, pre-industrial or non-industrial societies have a more circular thing. So it's about renewal, you know, so death begets life, destruction, be, you know, begets creation. It's, it's, you know, so as a matter of fact, Keshol is a Tzotzil Mayan word that means infant, but it also means replacement, grandparent, because souls are recycled. Corporal bodies, no, souls, yes. Now, Mesoamerican languages do not have terms for nature or religion because it's just part of their daily existence. It's not something you get on Saturday or on Sunday or something, it was just part of how they lived, how they engaged, how they interacted on a daily basis with every entity, okay? So they had similar things like to enter God in Yucatec, or a sacred righteous way of life in Sotzil. And Mayan languages are ergative. There's a plurality of subjects. So there's a de-emphasis on me, myself, and I, and instead, it's an emphasis on we, and that we includes clouds, plants, rivers, mountains, etc. And this quote from Astor Aguilera really you know, conveys this. Native Americans often refer to the sun, mountains, clouds, rain, and so forth in kin terms. So reciprocal relationships required acknowledgement and engagement via ceremonies and other types of interaction and collaboration. For example, forest collaboration. One of my former students, Colleen Lindsay, and one of my foremen, Mopan Maya Cleofochok, um, they set up these plots, these 40 meter diameter plots in areas with ancestral Maya sites in areas without. 
and they collected over 300 different species, different species. And Cleophil identified about 95% of them. And, and same with animals, birds, his, his knowledge is, is truly astounding. So when I asked him, I said, Cleophil, so I'm just curious, how come you, can, why can't you identify the other 5%? He said, because they have no use. <laughs> so, so other scholars over in the, since the 1980s have hypothesized that the primary force we see today, and probably the same elsewhere, is actually a descendant force representing thousands of years of this collaboration where Maya have been promoting, calling, interacting, you know, shaping the forest we see today. Okay. And the same goes for the fauna. And, and so healthy and biodiverse forests, because most tropical animals, mo the majority, cannot be bred in captivity. So when we find animal bones in the archaeological record and a diverse faunal remains, animal bones, then that's something one of my grad students, Rachel Taylor, is looking at for her dissertation research to look at diversity through time to assess past biodiversity and forest health. Another one, Yifan Wang, is using isotope analysis to look at animal practices, management, hunting, and all this kind of thing to look at the sustainable practices because nothing became extinct. Okay? Yet, remember, in the past, there were 7 to 11 million people living in this area compared to 1 million today when things are sort of, what's that term? Disappearing. Now, this is also, this diversity is mimicked in um, Cleofo's, uh, the home garden, in the Valley of Peace Village where he and um, my foreman and excavation assistants uh, live and their families. They have home gardens. Now, to, to the Western standards of what a garden is, it, it looks sort of, well, there's trees and bush, but everything has a role. Everything has a purpose. Some are domestic, some are non-domestic, some are local, some are non-local, and so on and so on. So the numbers on the map here represent the different kinds of species. You see a lot of the same number. But there are food, medicinal stuff, household items, like stuff to make brooms, poison you know, for fish, um, not for humans, of course. Um, construction materials, flowers, ornaments, you know, other kinds of ornamental stuff, you know, for the church these days and, and this kind of thing. And so this old tree stump in the front of the house is now used to churn butter. Everything's repurposed, everything's reused, everything's recycled. Okay. Now, there's other types of collaboration as well, including with openings in the earth. Any opening in the earth is a portal to the underworld where Jock, Chock, the rain god, resides and we're ancestors, you can communicate with ancestors. But it's also sacred slash dangerous, due to our lack of terminology, right? Um, and it's, you know, and it's also the origin of clouds and rain. And this is Aktun Tunichil Mugna, and they have lots of offerings, you know, and, and these look like they're just domestic utilitarian jars. But if you turn a jar on its side, it's a cave. If, if you turn it right side up, it could be a cenote, and I'll explain that in a moment. You know, so it's all relative to context. Um, and also human remains, some are ancestors, some are sacrificial sacrifices, and some are what I've classified as, as, as witches in the anthropological sense. Okay, that's another story as well. I've been exploring watery portals, in particular cenotes. A cenote is a steep-sided sinkhole fed by groundwater. Um, and in the northern lowland, because it's much lower elevation, the water table's much higher, so you have over 7,000 cenotes. In the southern lowlands, elevation is much higher, so the groundwater is much lower, so you have fewer cenotes. Where I work in northern central Belize, where the arrow is pointing at Cotter Blanca, there are several water bodies. We call them Cotter Blanca pools. Now, this map, again, is a soil map, and all the blue dots are individuals um, archaeological sites. They could be a mound or it could be a small center. So it's just the presence of ancestral Maya sites. And I want to show this because the pool numbered 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, those are lakes, you know, fed by surface water, rain, and all that. But the center ones, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and, and so on, those are cenotes. Yes, they have blue dots, but way fewer, and they're all ceremonial. None are residential, per se. Okay. So you have residential settlement near the lakes, but not the cenotes. So, and that's because I argue that they are pilgrimage destinations. 
which worldwide pilgrimage destinations, you can't desecrate them. So there's a minimal footprint. It's a type of collaboration, the absence, if you will. So there, here, because you can't, there's no cities here. There's no residences here, okay? And, and there's no agri evidence for agricultural fields as well. And because of that, flora and fauna can flourish, which fosters biodiversity and conservation. And this pool here, pool 20, is um, 100 meters diameter, to give you a sense, and 40 meters deep. Okay. Now, Car Blanca has a lot of portals. And the central ones here, especially pool one, is what I, um, I've been focusing on. Cara Blanca is white face. Um, it's at the base, these pools are at the base of a cliff, a limestone cliff. It's called incompetent limestone, it's soft, so a lot of the vegetation falls off, hence the white face. So at the base of a cliff. And so um, I don't dive, but I uh, uh, worked with a great team of cave exploration divers who've been awarded medals by the National Geographic Society. Pool one is over 230 feet deep. And there's a cave inside. You have a portal within a portal. And the top is like 100 meters feet below the surface. I'm sure the Maya knew about it. I'm sure they did. So you have a portal within a portal. So in terms of the, you know, the upping, the, you know, ticking the box of sacredness, or for lack of a better term, you know, the sacredness aspect. Um, and also, we found megafauna fossils, which um, one of my former grad students, Jean Larman, um, wrote on this with a colleague here, Stan Ambrose, and um, Greg McDonald, a paleontologist who focuses on giant sloths. Um, and I have um, one of the fossil bones in my office, if you're interested in seeing it, the arm bone. Instead of it being just this, it's like this big. It was about 20 feet long. OK, um, but th this talk isn't on mega uh, megafauna. But I had to show it, yes? But what I did as the archaeologist, not the diver, I excavated the water temple that was on the edge. I know it's a water temple because there were no household items, just big water vessels, wide orifice jars, and the more uh, archaeological terminology. Um, and they had been visiting here for centuries, the Maya, this pilgrimage destination, but it was only during the period between 800 and 900 CE when there were those m several multiple droughts. They came here and they built they spent a lot of time to build this water temple that's so close to the edge that the northeast, yes, has a part of it has collapsed into the pool. Um, they intensified their visits. They pleaded with the gods. But even despite this, when the gods refused and the ancestors refused to bring forth the rain, they still didn't build houses there. They still didn't farm there. They still didn't build cities. They left. What we did find, we found all of these wide orifice jars. They're called Cayo and Slipped, but they date to this period between 800 and 900. And even though they look, they might look the same, they actually come from all over the Maya area. So people are coming from all over the Maya area to this special place to plead with the gods. And I don't have time to talk about this finger-sized breaks, but you can never just leave anything. You have to deanimate it. You have to deactivate it. Remember, everything's animated. So you have, things have to be animated. Like a funeral rite, you have to be deanimated to say goodbye before it starts the journey on the next part of their life history. So the, but also, we had thousands of sherds and we're trying to glue them together, piece them together. None were complete. So they took pieces away with them or they threw them in the water, something. But none are complete, not one. And also, based on ethnohistoric and ethnographic information, Maya went on a scripted journey on a ceremonial circuit following the path of the sun. Well, the gods did this on purpose in this east-west configuration of the Carablanca pools. So they started in the east. At pool 20, we started excavations. Um, um, but again, to no avail. There's a sweat bath. And if you've been in the tropics, you do not need a sweat bath. Trust me. But this was for purification purposes and probably where visitors stayed. You couldn't stay at the pools. So in between pool one and two, which is just right off the map here. But, but, but no matter what, the Maya abandoned this, left, not abandoned, they left this area too. And they deanimated everything. Okay. 
Now, this is quite different than how things are, are treated today. Now this image here um, shows in the, the pre-hurricane, I'm on the lookout looking south, I'm on the, the cliff top looking south. And I go every year and take it from the lookout. Um, Yvonne, Rachel, and I did it this year as well. So this is in 2009, the pre-hurricane, and then there in 2010, October 2010 was Hurricane Richard, and this area was ground zero. And this whole area was owned by a sustainable logging company. For every tree they cut, they planted four. There was never any clear cutting. They would just go in. Yes, we would see stumps, but it was, it was, they were, they've been doing this for 30, de 30 years. But the hurricane was, was too much. With all the dead trees, then came the dry season. It just, fire, fire, thousands of acres. So they, unfortunately, I mean, they, well, oh, let me rephrase that. They had to sell <laughs> the land and an agricultural business bought it. This is what it looks like today from the same spot. And all those white smears you see are ancestral Maya farmsteads that dispersed. And so I was awarded a three-year National Science Foundation grant to do a salvage archaeology program to go in and excavate as much as possible. Because the Maya, you know that renewal, the cyclical thing? They would build in the same place, the same houses. I've excavated, you know, six by four meter size houses that were occupied for 800 years. But they would rebuild again and again and again about every 40, every 20 to 40 years, okay? So every time they plow, they plow away 50, 60, whatever years of history. So all the time, I was awarded in 2020, then the pandemic struck. I lost two seasons. So um, Rachel, Ifan, and I went in 2022, and um, we, we, we excavated 14 of the 15 planned structures, and um, I might do a field school. We're working out that, and then I'm going this season if we get permission. Um, the farmers don't understand why we do what we do, and, and it's, it's a negotiation, let's say, kind of thing. So um, the plan is to go back this summer and then in 2024. So I, you know, I had to make a choice. Do I leave Car Blanca for now and do this? It's like, yes, I can't leave this because in those two years we lost, I mean, I try not to think about it. I don't want to know how much history has been lost. Well, I do, but, you know, still tough. So what we're doing is, is both fulfilling but sad. Um, so the ancestral Maya, remember, fed more people in the past than, there, than the people do today using monocropping and clear cutting kind of thing. And it's so short term. It's not sustainable. Okay. So we are in the Anthropocene. And because of the divorce of nature and culture that happened in our world, where we have a hierarchical system where things are ranked has led us, you know, in the last 500 years especially, to try to control or tame nature, which has led us directly to where we are today, the Anthropocene, versus an inclusive worldview where everything's on the same plane, where people work with nature, collaborate with nature, results in a millennia of sustainable living. Okay. So what are the insights and current applications? Well, some, you know, when I read, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm involved, I've been involved with UNESCO and sustainability in the tropics and this kind of thing. And, um, and one of the things that when you look at government reports and ideas is the, the problem I see is that the issue is, it's just dealing with humans. How do we save us? But we rely on the earth and the resources, yeah? Does the earth need us? No. <laughs> so we cannot privilege humans in our future mitigation strategies, in our future strategies to deal with global climate change, to deal, you know, to present sustainability. It has to involve everyone, non-humans and humans alike. 
So, and you can learn a lot from traditional ecological knowledge and local stakeholders. I mean, I know the far some farmers have been here for six, seven generations. They have a lot of knowledge, you know, and that's critical, you know. So, and also the reliance on one thing the Maya shows and other, other many other societies, that diverse and flexible long-term um, are better than and non-path dependent strategies. Like Maya Kings, they got off the inclusive worldview path, you know? And they focused, they put all their efforts in monumental stuff and the reservoirs. They relied on the foundation of power only on one thing. And when the reservoirs started to um, dry up, so did their power. Okay. So diversify. So we need to collaborate with resources because there's a lot more food out there and medicines and building supplies and tools and game that can be used without causing their extinction or overuse, like at Cara Blanca, more nature reserves and parks to promote biodiversity and conservation. And biomimicry, like multi-cropping. Monocropping is a very recent phenomenon, relatively. And constructed wetlands, like did you realize that there are over 10 million swimming pools in the United States. Now voluntarily, of course, but you know, those can be turned into constructed wetlands. You can have water lilies and edible plants and medicinal plants and turtles and fish and all of that. And you can drink the water and you can still swim. And there are companies already that are um, constructing natural pools. And this would also fulfill the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 6 to ensure access to clean water for everyone as well as encourage the participation of local communities. Because, because you can build constructed wetlands at different scales. A community can do it together. It doesn't have to be you know, some big corporate entity. It could be a local small scale thing. Okay. And also, I didn't talk about this specifically, but and this is going to fascinate you, I know. We have yet to find in, in the archaeological record toilets. Because they likely use night soil to fertilize their home gardens, to fertilize their fields. And some of those white orifice jars were chamber pots, I'm sure. Okay. That's something to think about. Natural burials, when I said before that about 10%, only 10% of the, those millions of Maya have been buried in house floor, what about those other millions and millions of people over the thousands of years? Well, ethno-historically, the Maya would bury their dead and plant a tree over it. So not only is the primary forest we see today a forest that is shaped by the Maya, they are the Maya. It's a forest of Maya souls my people, okay? And all of these start in the home. Laws, national, state, local, will not work without the support and without the action of all of us. Okay. And diversity is key for sustainable existence and to adapt to global climate change. Now there's other insights and applications about green cities, local resource networks, changing labor technology ratios, multi-purpose recycling, um, which I'm working on. I'm revising a book called Maya Wisdom and the Survival of Our Planet for um, Oxford University Press. In conclusion, we need to preserve our past as cultural heritage for descendants, to enjoy for everyone and to benefit our future. We're learning so much about the past. The Maya is just one case. I'm just, I'm just, it's the tip of the iceberg or whatever comparable thing there is in the tropics. Because I'm just, yeah, I'm just, all right. Um, with that, thank you. And we do have time for questions. There will be people going around with microphones, and then there will be people on Zoom, I believe. Any questions? Yes? Oh, I'll I guess they have to choose. Uh, I, <laughs> that's so loud. Uh, I want to thank you for the wonderful presentation. I have a question about how knowledge that's local to 
ancestral Maya homelands, how we can take that idea and apply it to a place like Illinois where so little remnant prairie is left. Like how could we work with, for example, Miami or Peoria Nation in order to you know, tap into their knowledge but without appropriating their knowledge for our benefit so that it creates benefits for them as well as us? Um, that's a, a good question. It's, it's about involving people, not just you know, a, a superficial involvement. It's about actual collaboration working with. Because there's, there's a lot of uh, scholarship about and, and work about tr incorporating traditional ecological knowledge. For example, um, Works Land Program, where it's a mix of not expanding farming lands anymore, but adding native trees and adding native this so you can add so you can produce your own pollinators support your own pollinators for example um, uh, also um, subsistence intensification where you learn from again traditional ecological knowledge to uh, and non-chemical means you know using natural means of pest control for example natural means of fertilizer this kind of thing without again expanding but just intensifying but using natural means as, 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 as much as possible so um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's something we need to do and not talk about for sure. Um, I was just curious if you see also any value in kind of the leaving of the Maya in kind of today's context. What do you mean leaving? Um, I'm just curious in um, our society and our world today if there are areas in which you see value of kind of taking the approach of like leaving said area, um, much uh, like the Maya did. You mean migration? Yeah. You know, I mean, climate migrants, mi migration has been a part of human history since Homo erectus. I mean, it's not a new thing. And it's something that the, the question is, because it's global climate change, the issue is where do you go? You know, it, things are going to be impacted differently kind of thing. So no, I mean, and, it, you know, we have the luxury of being able to up and leave any time. Not that I'm going to. Right? So, I mean, but some people don't have a choice. And, you know, and, and borders and, and territorial and political and prejudices and all of this kind of stuff. That's the, the main stopping point. But a lot of people are trying to leave. As one of my students in my Anthropology 278 that I teach every semester, Janet, said when we're talking about migration, we, they, we, they debate about it. Um, it's, it. And she said, they leave to live. So it's a question of if they can. And a lot of people want to, it's a question of they can't. So I, yeah, I think it's, a, it's something that needs to be done and addressed. Thank you. We have a question from the Zoom chat. Um, so this says, regarding a comment you made earlier that you hadn't been able to conduct field work for several reasons, including that local farmers didn't understand what you were doing. Does your project include some outreach with local communities so that they can get involved and understand? What challenges have you encountered in trying to socialize your work lo locally? Um, yes and no. I my um, foremen and field assistants are all Maya and come from the Valley of Peace Village, which is mostly Maya. Um, it's not a question of me socializing or them, it's them educating me. <laughs> um, seriously, um, I mean, we work together, we collaborate. I'm not in terms of research though. They are, it's, um, but it's something that I don't know. It's. I mean, I, I spend so much time with their families. It's very informal. I don't have anything formal. But there is, um, it, it's called Belize Education Network. That's in, it's only about a year and a half old. And, and when I get, when I finally hopefully get permission very soon from the local farmers, um, I'm going to contact them about expanding that to do more like uh, public lectures. I mean, I give them reports and they share with everyone. And they have, I mean, internet, they have some internet kind of thing. So it's, 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 it's not perfect. I could do better for sure.
Thank you, Lisa, for the wonderful talk. Um, I, um, the, the main take home message for me from your talk is we can learn a lot from the Mayas. I mean, that's the way I understood it. But there are two kinds of lessons that we can learn. Um, the, the one is that they had, an, had a civilization that lasted such a long time. It seemed like your talk focused on that, that aspect of it. But obviously, in the end, they also collapsed, or, or at least they dispersed. And what, what lessons can we learn from the fact that they actually eventually they had to disperse, dispersed? Because there, there are, uh, I can imagine that there are communities all around the world who are going through something similar to what Mayas went through except that they don't know that they are going through that. They, you know, I, I can talk about my own community back, back home in Sri Lanka. So, um, so my, my question is really, what kind of lessons can we learn? Well, so they must have made, there must have been some extraordinary circumstances that led to their dispersal or collapse, uh, in spite of the fact that they had this long-term, if well-established civilization. So yes. that is my question. Thank you, um, Dr. Siva Plan. Um, well, the, the main issue is that uh, in terms of what happened, what lasted a thousand years was kingship. You know, one of the things that I've learned by you know studying cross-cultural cases and the impact of climate change is, you know, people, families, farmers, commoners, 99 percenters, you know, they might move and whatever, but it's the political systems that come and go. Like take Egypt, for example. That area has been continuously occupied by agriculturalists since, what, 4,000 BCE. You know, pharaohs gone, you know, come and go, different political systems. I mean, even in the last 10 years kind of thing. That's what collapses or is really sensitive, and that's based on their power source. So for the Maya, they relied too much on reservoirs to attract subjects during the dry season. You know, they didn't have anything else to draw them in, honestly, because they relied on the forest, they relied on their fields, but during the dry season in areas, they, these areas had lots of great agricultural soil, by the way, but they didn't have a lot of surface water. But so during the dry season, the kings failed in their job to bring forth rain to, fill, you know, to replenish the reservoirs. So, so, so people just left. They said, it's a drastic measure, but we've got to take care of our families, we're, we're going. So the lesson is the path dependency of relying just on one source Again, the portfolio thing, the financial portfolio and vitamins, you know, make sure we have all the vit multiple vitamins we need, right? We can't just eat McDonald's french fries every day, I wish. Um, you know, but we need the multiple vitamins. So they were path dependent on the, uh, became path dependent just like we are in fuels kind of thing right now. So the issue is we can't be path dependent, but we are. But people are great humans. We use our brain to, to take self-denial I mean, to denial to, to new heights. We realize it when we're looking over our shoulder when it's, you know. So I'm just saying, let's, let's get ahead of the game. Because it is, I mean, I don't, you know, it, it, things are happening. It's like, wake up kind of thing. So it's, it's about getting things. And then, you know, the distrust of scholars by the general populace these days is really distressing. So this book is for that I'm writing, that I'm working on, is for the general audience. You know, it's not, I mean, academics, you're welcome to read it, of course. <laughs> um, but, you know, I wanted, I wanted to share this. And I have stories with Cleofo, Ernesto and Cleofo. So I've been with Cleofo, you know, his, when his kids were this old, now they're having their own children. I mean, they are my second family. Families. So did I answer your question, Siva? This is a question from the Zoom. Uh, thanks for the inspiring talk. What do you think about combining these ancient wisdoms with modern technology to further improve our living condition? Would that be something useful? Um, well, you know, I have an issue with modern technology because all this green technology, what is it based on? Finite resources. You know, electric cars are based on batteries, batteries that are mined in very unsafe ways. and. The, the, the uh, cobalt, cad cadmium, and what else? One more. Thank lithium. They're finite. 
and solar panel. I'm, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm just saying we have to really think outside the box. Right now, it's just, it's these, all of these green resources, all this technology is based on finite resources that requires us to further desecrate the earth. So, like, I, I know there's a lot of research on, I read somewhere about bacteria being used as a battery power. That would be cool. Um, there are, uh, somebody, I remember a zoo several years ago was trying to raise funds, so they made paper out of elephant dew. You know, um, I mean, just being really creative, really thinking outside the box, because technology is only going to take us so far, and we're going to reach that plateau sooner than we think. That's part of that denial bit I was mentioning earlier. Hi, Professor. Thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation. I'm very attracted to the idea uh, when people uh, die, they get buried under a tree. I think it's a very, very beautiful idea. And also made me think about my hometown because uh, I'm from a small village in China. And when people died, they, uh, they got buried in the farmland oh. where they have been working throughout their whole life. But the difference is, um, uh, we we still use coffins, and usually we, when they got buried, there's a pile of dirt uh, or earth. You know, uh, basically people cannot farm that part anymore. Um, so I think Maya people did an even better job. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I'm a little curious. If sorry if I missed it, um, you mentioned 90 percent of people get buried under the tree, something like that, right? Well. We do, let me turn that around. We know that 10% were buried in the floors of tombs, um, houses, and the like. The question is, there's no Maya cemeteries. There's no cemeteries. Uh -huh. The only time we find human remains are in houses. So like in the, the, the plowed areas, we have to collect the human remains or they'll just be strewn about. But, um, but the, so we don't know exactly because we, the, some are in caves, but not, you know, so the, the, this is just a hypothesis that they were given back because it's the souls that are recycled, right? That's what's significant, not the corporal remains. Right. I'm a little bit curious, like, who got buried under the tree and who got buried well, under um, the houses? Some archaeologists suggest that it was the person who died closest to a calendrical event, 20 years and 40 years. They had a vigesimal system, base 20 versus us, like base 10. So 20, 40, 60, so on. So they had a very intricate calendrical, a, a ritual calendar and a solar calendar that intersected and all this kind of stuff. So, so that's why we find men, women, children. So, so whoever, whoever, some archaeologists hypothesize, whoever died closest to these calendrical events, which is also you need to replace your thatch roof every 20, 40 years because a lot of things live up there, trust me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Lisa, very much for sharing your important work with us this afternoon. And I'd also like to thank the audience, those of you that are here in the room, and those of you who are online, um, and also those who will watch later for being part of this presentation and for making LIS your community and making it a vibrant and energizing place to be. I hope that this presentation opens the door for more thought and discussion, and I invite those of you who are in the room to join us at the back for some refreshments. Uh, Lisa thought that that might have been the reason you actually came out in the rain, but I told her no, it was because of her wonderful presentation. So please, just one more round of applause for her. Thank you.